Hi, and welcome again to uh, the uh, slurry surfacing certification uh, class. Uh, my name's Chuck Ingram. I work with slurry pavers in Richmond, Virginia. And again, another shout out to the ISSA, uh, International Slurry Surfacing Association, for uh, uh, letting us use their inspector's manual uh, as a source document for a lot of this training. We're going to get into chapter four now with the slurry surfacing equipment and some construction techniques and it should be fairly easy for you to follow right along with us. What we're going to talk about uh, uh, in chapter four is going to be the type of placement machines or application equipment that uh, uh, that we're putting to use on these projects with slurry seal and microsurfacing. Uh, there is, uh, as you can imagine, uh, the need for some support equipment that goes along with it, and we'll graphically see uh, what type of support uh, units and support equipment is necessary for the basic operation. Uh, we'll see and find out what, uh, what is a slurry paver, what is a slurry surfacing machine look like, and we'll distinguish between uh, the types and sizes of, uh, of application equipment that's, uh, that, that's being used in the field today. Um, we had talked earlier about this job starting at a stockpile uh, where all the raw materials are, are uh, sourced uh, from and transported out to the paving train uh, to be mixed and laid uh, on site. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the stockpile management uh, of that. Um, application rates and how we apply some of these materials we'll talk about. There are different types of spreader boxes. You know, once, once you see what type of equipment we're looking at and think back to some of the video that we've already seen, uh, there is a spreader box or a drag box behind the paving equipment uh, that, that actually contains and then distributes uh, the, the slurry surfacing mix. Talk about how important it is to take care of your equipment, uh, inspect it and keep it in, in clean uh, operating uh, condition. And we're going to touch just briefly because it's a separate uh, uh, module in itself for equipment calibration. But we'll, we'll talk briefly about the importance of, of calibrating your slurry surfacing equipment. So what is a slurry paver? What is a slurry surfacing machine? Well, it's a transport vehicle. It, it's, a, it's a piece of equipment that hauls aggregate. It's like a dump truck. It's a portable asphalt plant. You know, we're taking all these raw materials somewhere to a site and uh, the materials, as I said, are mixed and laid on site. So it's a portable type of a batch plant. It also mixes and applies the equipment. So it's, it's really a paver itself. And although uh, it's, it, we don't necessarily utilize a compaction tool or a roller in any of these uh, slurry surfacing materials, except in uh, very, very few and isolated spots, um, it, it too will be its own compaction equipment. So uh, it's, it's all of these things in one package. You know, we're delivering all of the, the raw materials to a paving uh, piece of equipment and mixing and laying as the, as the machine is in operation moving down the road. It, it comes in different sizes, shapes, and colors. Uh, there will be some truck mount pavers. You'll hear us talk about truck mount pavers. Uh, they'll come in different sizes and shapes. Uh, but they're basically a self-contained paver in itself. All the raw materials are, are on board these machines as you see them here. Uh, your aggregate is on board, your liquid uh, asphalt emulsion is on board, as is uh, some water that's going to be a critical component to the final mix uh, as well. The truck mount pavers uh, uh, in and of themselves have some advantages and some disadvantages. But uh, the bottom line is that these truck mount pavers can really be used uh, on any uh, any roadway surface that uh, the contract calls for. Uh, there are some uh, specifications that may uh, limit the use of these, these types of equipment, um, uh, but, but largely they're a very flexible uh, piece of equipment. You can utilize these on any type of a roadway. Uh, you don't need as many uh, people on the crew with a truck mount operation versus some of the others. And it is, like I said, it's a dump truck. It's, it, it can move from one job to another. Say if you're paving two or three streets in one neighborhood and you want to go over and pave two or three streets in another neighborhood three or four miles down the road, you can get this paving equipment there a whole lot quicker than some of the others. It's very maneuverable. You know, depending on the, the size of this truck mounted unit, uh, there's different axle setups that you can have. They're very maneuverable. Uh, that's why they are 
uh, generally used more in uh, smaller confined areas such as cul-de-sacs or parking lots. Some disadvantages of the truck mounted units are that once you empty that compartment of stone on the machine, it, it could be a 10 yard machine, it could be a 12 yard machine, um, it's, it's going to necessitate stopping, unhooking your spreader box, and bringing in another truck mounted unit uh, to continue paving, which means you're gonna have a transverse joint about every uh, 1,000 to 1,500 uh, uh, linear feet. Uh, heavy axle loadings, uh, you need to be careful with uh, the distribution of the material on that. Again, there's multiple axles, uh, uh, configurations that can be chosen depending on the type of work that you're, you're gonna outline for this type of work. Um, it's, a, it's an expensive piece of equipment to operate when you look at it in terms of the fact that three-fourths of the, the life of that pavement is spent driving to and from the job, from the stockpile to the job itself. Very little bit of the time that that machine is actually operated is it mixing and laying uh, uh, the material. Uh, the operator on the back of that machine does not have control of the forward speed of the, of the paver. And we'll talk about some of the other types of equipment that uh, that, different, that differs with. And it's maneuverable. Again, you know, it's a good thing or a bad thing sometimes. It's, uh, uh, but it's uh, very maneuverable uh, in, in certainly tighter quarters than some of the other, uh, the other options we have in terms of operations uh, and, and application equipment. And you can see it's uh, starting off with uh, clean aggregate in the hopper bin there, and it's all being transported back. The materials are being transported back to the back of the machine. The operator has control of the recipe, if you will. Um, and uh, that truck is being used right there in a neighborhood setting, which is probably the right setting for uh, that type of equipment. It's uh, a lot of cul-de-sacs and a lot of smaller, uh, uh, smaller areas for the equipment to get into. You know, conversely now, we have uh, what we'll call and refer to as a continuous paver. And if you think back to some of the video we looked at in chapter one, uh, a lot of that slurry seal and microsurfacing was actually being placed by a continuous paver. Now the difference between this paver and the truck mounted units is that in this case here, the green machine uh, will stay put on the project. The, the truck in front of it will be transporting the raw materials to and from. Uh, obviously this uh, type of a paving train takes up a lot more space than, uh, than maybe some of the truck mounted units that we've talked about a minute ago. Uh, and thereby it's, it's a little bit more advantageous to use this type of equipment on, on, on longer pulls, uh, whether it's a primary road or, or uh, even an interstate highway. And here uh, we'll see a little bit of a video of the continuous run paver uh, operating here. Uh, you can see right off the bat that now there's more equipment in this picture than there was with that truck mounted unit paving in the subdivision a minute ago. Uh, the truck with the black tanks in front of the white paver are transporting or transferring all of the raw materials to uh, the white paver on the back. And from that point on, it's very similar to what the truck mounted operation was doing. Uh, the operator in the back has full control of not only the recipe, but in this case, the guy on the back of the white machine can control the forward speed of the paver. But really and truly what it comes down to is the finished product coming out of the back end of both of these pieces of equipment, be it a truck mounted unit or continuous paver, is identical. So advantages of that continuous operation, um, you know, we'll go back to the trucks where uh, every time you empty one of those truck mounted pavers, you have to unhook the spreader box and start again with a, a new construction joint about every 12 to 1500 feet. Advantages with this type of continuous operation is the fact that by design, we're, we're trying to accomplish fewer transverse joints. You can minimize those joints in several ways. You can uh, uh, alter the forward paving speed of the equipment. You can, um, you can stage your stockpile area uh, closer to the to the paver to the paving operation itself uh, which is a quicker turnaround for those support units bringing materials to you 
or you can simply add more uh, support units uh, to feed the continuous run paver. But the whole goal is to achieve fewer construction joints uh, or transverse joints with the use of this continuous piece of equipment. I mentioned during the video that the operator has full control of the forward speed. You can cover a whole lot more ground uh, with this type of equipment. Again, uh, if you uh, are staged properly and you have enough support equipment to, to continually feed the, uh, the paver. One other uh, advantage of a continuous paver versus uh, the, the truck mount unit, you know, again, the truck mount unit is a, uh, basically a dump truck. You got a left-hand side driver station. On this paver, you have a driver station on both sides, uh, which will enable him to take a look and be very mindful of, of edge of pavement, no matter what direction he's paving uh, with regard to edge of pavement. Uh, you've got uh, the haul trucks that are, that are shuttling material back and forth and as compared to uh, the truck mounted pavers, uh, your haul trucks are uh, getting uh, uh, a lot more use out of, uh, out of themselves than, uh, uh, than maybe the paver will uh, with a truck mounted unit. Um, you have one calibration on, on a continuous paver. Uh, whereas if you have multiple truck mounted units, each one of those truck mounted paving units needs to be calibrated to ensure uh, consistency in the mat. We'll talk a little bit about that in a little while. Some disadvantages to using a continuous run paver on your operation. If the paver breaks, you're done. Whereas if you're on a truck mounted paver uh, uh, crew and you've got three or four of the truck mounted units, you lose one truck, you still got three uh, pavers that are still working on the project, but uh, if this continuous paver breaks on you, you're done for the day. Um, if you're in that same situation that we talked about moving from one subdivision to another, if you're three or four miles down the road, you can drive those truck units a lot quicker and be set up and working a whole lot sooner than you would be if you had to mobilize and transfer uh, uh, this continuous run paver, uh, if you had to tram it by itself from project to project. It's a larger crew. You're going to have uh, uh, several more crew members on this crew. Uh, truck mount unit crew may carry anywhere from 15 to 16, 17 men. Uh, you get into a continuous run paver operation, you could be upwards of 22, 23 men on a crew. And again, the disadvantage to that is you got one piece of equipment on the job. So you got one paver, one job, where you could be actually with a truck mounted unit, you could be paving in those two subdivisions at the same time, uh, provided you had enough traffic control to, uh, uh, to take care of safety. And just uh, again, a couple of differences uh, between the continuous run operation and the truck mounted pavers. You got the uh, different size uh, support units, whether it's a trailer mounted unit or a tandem size unit, um, but you can stack them all up in front of a continuous run paver and uh, for all intents and purposes, put enough material uh, in front of that paver that you can go uh, for quite a ways uh, without having to recharge uh, the paver or construct a uh, transverse joint. And the support equipment uh, that's necessary for either a continuous operation or a truck mounted unit, uh, with regard for a continuous run operation, you're going to need several nurse trucks in order to keep any, any production up. Uh, you're going to need to clean the pavement regardless, so you're going to need some mobile sweepers or at least a front mount uh, uh, kick broom uh, to get the pavement swept off of any loose debris. Uh, when it comes to microsurfacing, you're going to need to have a distributor on hand to place your tack coat. We saw that in the chapter one video uh, with a tack coat being applied just ahead of the microsurfacing job that we saw. Uh, you're not going to need the tack truck for uh, a slurry seal operation, but you will with your microsurfacing. You know, we said that uh, uh, the rolling was uh, part, of, part of the uh, capabilities of this, this type of a slurry paver or application equipment. Um, typically, no compaction is necessary. Your rolling traffic is gonna take care of that. Uh, in the case of parking lots or airfields, uh, would be an exception to that. You know, you're not going to get enough constant concentrated uh, traffic uh, in either one of those situations to achieve the, uh, the compaction that you're looking for. Um, you're going to need various types of traffic control equipment depending on what the, uh, uh, the job is set up for. Uh, you're going to need, uh, in, in addition to tankers of emulsion that are being staged on the job from day to day, 
you're going to need another tanker of water that's going to be filled up probably every day uh, with some potable water from, uh, uh, from a water source locally uh, that's going to aid in the mixing of the slurry surfacing materials. Uh, we'll get into the need of a screening plant in just a little while, but uh, not all stone hauled to a job is to perfect gradation, so we need to ensure proper gradation somehow, and usually the way to do that is with a screening plant on hand. Just a quick schematic, you know, we, we, we mentioned about uh, uh, the back end of the machine, whether it's a truck mounted unit or a continuous unit, all being pretty much the same. What we're looking for is the same final product at the back end, but uh, you know, we have an aggregate feed uh, that's going to drop into a mixing chamber here, and we haven't really talked about the mineral fillers. We'll get into that in a little while. Um, but all of the dry components are introduced by conveyor to the front end of the mixing chamber to start with. At that point, your, uh, your liquids, your water, and your asphalt emulsion are introduced, and it's mixed pretty quickly and put into your spreader box while the machine's moving. And uh, I'd say from front to back of that mixing chamber, you've probably got about 15 to 20 seconds worth of mixing uh, that's going on. Uh, we'll see in just a few minutes a little bit of extra mixing, if you will. It's not designed that way, but there will be some distribution of material that happens in this spreader box while the paver is going. Uh, but just quickly, you know, how we deliver the material from, uh, uh, from aggregate bin to the back of the, back of the paver and on the road. Paver calibration. Um, we're just really going to briefly touch on that because there is a whole other module that covers calibration in detail. Um, but I just want to make very clear that it, it's very critical that all the equipment uh, that's used on a slurry surfacing project uh, be calibrated to, mix, to match uh, the mix design that's been submitted for your project. Um, and these, these machines have got to be calibrated uh, using the same aggregate and the same emulsion that you're using on whatever project that you're on. So the operator, the superintendent uh, with the contractor should have paperwork uh, to show you uh, just, just what those calibration and gate settings uh, should be uh, for each of the uh, combinations of aggregate and emulsion that you're using. Now, by spec, it, it calls for those machines to be calibrated at least once a year, and they'll have a library and a, a collection of what those calibrations look like for all these material combinations. But if something happens where you have to change materials, or if you have an asphalt pump, say, that goes bad, or you need to change out one of the pumps on the machine, or if some work is done on the conveyor belt system, uh, such as changing a belt out or even changing the skirt rubbers, uh, that's cause for recalibration because all of those instances will affect the uh, distribution of materials as they're going into the mixing chamber. Um, so, you know, and it's a good idea too uh, to just double check uh, with the calibration of the emulsion um, at, at every project. You know, if you're going from one county to another inside of a district, maybe not, uh, maybe it's not that critical. Uh, but frequent calibration with regard to the emulsion uh, is certainly recommended. Why do we calibrate? Again, it's, it's just important uh, that the mix ratios um, of materials stay in line with the mix design. Uh, with a continuous run paver, uh, we talked about uh, the one really good advantage of having a continuous run paver on a job is you, you're calibrating one piece of equipment. But we'll see in a few minutes uh, uh, just dramatic reasons why you need to calibrate on jobs where you're using multiple truck mounted pavers. Uh, you're going to ensure the quality control of the system for the contractor and the buying agency by good and effective and consistent calibration. And those calibrations uh, will be a basis for recording the amount of all the materials used. A lot of your newer, uh, most of the paving equipment on VDOT schedules these days will have the ability to give you an actual printout at the end of the day uh, to quantify just how much materials uh, have been used. And equipment's not worth anything if it's dirty and out of calibration or just, just simply uh, neglect uh, from, uh, from maintenance. Uh, make sure it's clean especially the mixer. You know, back in the back end of that mixer, um, it, it, it's going to be critical to get, uh, uh, to get it cleaned out on a, on a nightly basis. 
Uh, otherwise, you start up the next morning, you can have some dried or some set, some cured slurry seal or microsurfacing hung up in the, in the uh, mixing chamber itself. And regardless of any screening operations or quality control methods that you've taken, you can contaminate the mix simply by not cleaning your equipment the night before. Uh, one thing to look out for, particularly with uh, continuous run machines, is aggregate spillage. Uh, it's hard to detect and you need to be looking for it. It's underneath the belly of the machine as you're going along the road. There could be a, 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 a tendency for some dry aggregate to fall off of the bottom of the belt as it's returning uh, back up to the head pulley. So, so check, uh, check under the machine, uh, check around the, uh, the, the skirting at the front hopper. Uh, be, be sure that you've got all your skirts and all of your uh, containment methods in place to, to keep that aggregate from, from falling on the road. What you're going to be doing at that point is contaminating a, a, a surface. And liquid leaking, uh, hydraulic oil, fuel oil, obviously those are contaminants on a pavement that are going to uh, preclude this material from sticking to it. So have a, have a, dr a dry, clean pavement uh, ahead of the paver, uh, checking for leaks. You know, can, be sure your equipment is uh, in good operating uh, uh, capacity before uh, before proceeding. Stockpile management, you know, it's a, it's a good idea to, to have a staging area that's not in the middle of somebody's field where you've got clumps of grass or uh, wheel ruts in a mudded area or something like that. A good hard surface that drains well uh, is preferred. It doesn't necessarily have to be a paved surface. Um, you know, many stockpiles that are used by contractors are, are utilized year after year and have a good stone base on them. Uh, but certainly something that's not going to be rutted and, 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 and be soft enough to, uh, to be a, a danger of contaminating the aggregate that's being loaded. You want it to be close to the job, close enough to a job uh, that you're not going to have a whole lot of wait time. Um, keep the stockpile clean. You know, it's always, it's a lot easier to operate around a, uh, a, a staging area that everything is in its place and everything has a place. Have a containment plan in place if necessary. You know, we're dealing with, uh, with some materials that uh, you don't want to be leaking into streams uh, or, or nearby uh, drainage areas. Be fortunate enough to have a, a, a staging area like the one here in the picture where it's big enough that you can allow for a, a safe movement and flow of equipment through, uh, uh, through the staging area. Uh, have enough room to set up your screen and plant. We've referred to it a couple times, but really and truly you're going to need enough space to stockpile your stone twice. You know, that, sta that screening plant is going to be taking the material as it's delivered, screen through and creating another stone pile. So you're going to need a little bit of space uh, to operate efficiently and safely. Now we talk about the screening plant and the importance of it. Uh, even though your aggregate is pre-approved for gradation as it's being shipped and you have a guaranteed gradation coming out of the quarry, that's coming off the belt or coming off the ground of the quarry. You don't know who's hauling this material to you from the quarry sometimes. You know, the guy who contract hauler bringing your number 10 rock dust to you could have been hauling topsoil or 21A's or something the night before and maybe not cleaned the, uh, the bed of his truck out properly and inadvertently contaminated your, your stone pile uh, at delivery. So it's a good idea just, just go ahead and screen every bit of the material that's delivered, uh, run it through a scalping screen that's set up to match the gradation of the stone called for on the project. And sometimes you'll be surprised at what actually gets screened out. You, know, you can see, see here we've, we've gotten a chunk of concrete, we've got some two by fours. There's all sorts of stuff that comes through a contract hauler's truck uh, that makes it to a staging area that uh, it, it's good to catch it and screen it before it gets, gets sent out to the paver. This is just a, a drone shot of a Pretty good size staging area, very effective. You can see here what I said a minute ago about uh, the stone pile there that you're looking at is the delivered stone. And it had been run through the screening plant, just a side of it. The small stone pile underneath the belt has been screened. Uh, the operator here is just doing a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, he had just uh, finished loading one of the other transport vehicles, but that was just a, a good example of uh, uh, a good size staging area, good effective use of, of, of property. You know, we're going to be storing a lot of liquids uh, on job, whether it's an emulsion tanker or a water tanker, but uh, 
uh, strategically try to avoid uh, areas near lakes or streams, uh, any drainage appurtenance that we might, uh, might possibly contaminate inadvertently. Uh, there's been times when even vandalism on weekends has happened, so just be very mindful and very careful about uh, uh, locating these staging areas. Uh, you may be required on some projects to actually dike the area around your uh, asphalt emulsion um, tankers. Uh, dome lids and valves on the tankers, close them and lock them at night. If you happen to spill some emulsion, um, whatever size spill it is, just take care of it and clean it up immediately. Uh, the quickest, cleanest way to clean up a small spill is obviously you've got tons and tons of, of dry aggregate there at your disposal. Uh, just use some of your screenings on site to, uh, to sop up some, uh, some emulsion that may get spilled. Um, there's nothing in this material that's necessarily contaminated. Uh, but uh, you know your your safety data sheets will uh, uh, will clarify that. But uh, uh, but just if there is a spill and you do contain it and you do mix it up with some of your dry aggregate, keep that material uh, clearly separate from uh, from where you're going to be loading equipment. You know it's not bad material. You could even use it for pothole filling uh, for the agency or owner uh, whose property you're 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 using for your staging area. Um, and environmentally a no-brainer is don't use uh, any fuel uh, or solvents to clean your equipment off with. There's some environmentally friendly stuff to clean asphalt off of equipment. Just a couple pictures of stockpile management, stockpile safety, uh, keeping your valves locked, especially at nighttime and over the weekends. Just don't be a temptation. Um, you'll see this uh, slide here probably more than once, but uh, you know we're moving from uh, the staging area out to the projects, and the application temperatures are critical to these thin treatments. Um, you can't place these thin slurry surfacing materials on pavements or surfaces with puddled water. Uh, don't place it on a surface less than 50 degrees Fahrenheit, except and unless. Now Virginia has uh, uh, areas in their specification that allow for application if morning temperatures are 40 degrees but the forecast high is going to be above 60 Fahrenheit uh, then that's going to create uh, not only a warm enough ambient condition but a warm enough surface condition uh, that you can safely place these slurry surfacing materials. Um, the big thing to worry about you know you've got some of these borderline temperature restrictions that you're going to deal with on a, on a regular basis in the spring and the fall but be very careful with uh, application of materials if any freezing temperatures are forecast in the next 24 hours. Uh, that could be the biggest, uh, uh, the biggest problem um, that you'll face with, with temperature restrictions is uh, just being very mindful of, uh, of the temperature restrictions and not, not placing anything if it's going to be freezing temperatures in the next 24 hours. And, and be mindful too that these ambient and pavement temperatures are going to affect uh, the curing of whether slurry seal or microsurfacing. All your slurry surfacing uh, materials will be affected uh, by ambient and pavement temperatures. Perhaps the microsurfacing a little bit less so than the slurry seal. We discussed that, uh, you know, with the chemical break and curing that, uh, that happens with the microsurfacing, but still um, these are warmer weather applications. Uh, initially the water gets expelled from the microsurfacing chemically whereas the slurry seal itself is more ambient uh, condition driven uh, and dependent uh, for that material to dry and be ready for traffic. And even when the traffic is onto your material at the end of a paving shift, there's still some residual moisture that remains in that mix. And even though you're running traffic on it and you're having no trouble with tracking or anything else, there's enough moisture left in that mix is why we need to be really careful with that freezing temperature at night, okay? Uh, sometimes we'll have extremely hot and humid conditions that are going to affect the curing of this material as well. You know, humidity just holds moisture in and sometimes slows down the, the drying and the curing. Uh, but we in the, in the industry will have the ability when we're manufacturing emulsions to, to hopefully uh, uh, custom or tailor make some of these emulsions to fit the, uh, the climate that we're dealing with. Know that slurry surfaces are going to be tender for a while in hot humid weather. And you might, in, you might see some scuffing, uh, power steering marks, and we'll see an example of that in a minute. But uh, even though it's dry enough for traffic and it's durable enough to withhold uh, full rolling traffic, uh, the, the surface temperature and the ambient temperatures are just going to keep this material 
um, at some point near, near softening points. Uh, so just be, be mindful that uh, straight running traffic may not be uh, harmful to the slurry surfacing material, but, but you're sitting still and twisting power steering marks might happen uh, until the material has a chance to fully set. During hot, humid weather, use the spray bars. This picture here kind of shows that. When it's hot and humid, uh, the surface temperatures in some cases can exceed 130, 135 degrees. Uh, what happens when a slurry surfacing material being 3 16ths of an inch thick hits a pavement that hot, it could cause a soft, or a, a, a false cure, if you will. Uh, it could start curing from the bottom up and the top down. And the material will set so quickly on a hot pavement without a little bit of water sprayed on it uh, that it might not have a chance to fully bond. So during hot, dry conditions, uh, that's, that's uh, one time when uh, the use of a spray bar uh, could be very advantageous. Tack coats, briefly, we, uh, we talked about that. Uh, you're gonna use tack coat uh, ahead of the microsurfacing application only. It's not necessary for the slurry. Uh, typically we'll use the same emulsion that's being used on the project and we're going to dilute that emulsion uh, one part water to three parts emulsion uh, to be used as a tack coat. And depending on the surface texture, how porous or how smooth it is, the application rate may vary between a tenth or a fifteen hundredths of a gallon per square yard on the tack coat. Um, sometimes a very highly oxidized pavement uh, can, can be a good spot for, uh, uh, for utilizing these tack coats, particularly on the busier roads. Scratching and leveling, um, that's something that you're gonna be able to accomplish only with a microsurfacing. Um, again, with the chemistry that's involved and the quicker setting tendencies of this material, you can do a little bit of uh, minor uh, profiling, certainly some, uh, some rut reprofiling with the microsurfacing. Uh, but when you're using a scratch coat or a leveling coat with the microsurfacing, you always do that with a full width uh, spreader box. Uh, you're going to concentrate on just applying enough material to fill the surface voids um, and, and those irregularities. You're going to be attacking some of the ruts if they're less than a half an inch in depth. Uh, you can do that with your full width uh, spreader box. Um, if the contractor's set up for it, uh, a steel strike off can even be utilized. They're not utilized that often, uh, but typically a uh, stiffer rubber strike off in the spreader box uh, is used for a uh, uh, scratch or level course. And then typically once you've accomplished your, your scratch and level and minor leveling, uh, you're going to cover that up with your second application of a full width uh, microsurfacing application. Spreader boxes, just like any other tool, use the right one. Um, there's some older slurry seal spreader boxes out there that don't have augers in them. Um, most every box that you're gonna see in the different sizes and shapes are gonna have some sort of auger configurations in them. Uh, the the microsurfacing ones may, uh, may even have a dual, uh, will typically have a dual setup of augers uh, in there to keep the material moving uh, in the spreader box and keep it active and keeping it from setting. You want to keep all the uh, spreader boxes, augers, and the surfaces of that box clean. You know, much like we talked about keeping the uh, mixing chambers clean at the end of the evening, uh, a spreader box that's got dried uh, slurry or microsurfacing material on it uh, can contaminate the mix itself. So uh, at every opportunity you get, make sure that the spreader box is, uh, is cleaned and, and uh, no, no thick uh, excess material is allowed to uh, come dislodged. We're going to use a uh, burlap drag for slurry seal um, on the back of those spreader boxes, uh, depending on what size and what type. You know, when you're using a slurry, slurry box, uh, burlap is typically used for uh, creating a uniform texture. Uh, but then, uh, much like the slurry boxes and the mixing chambers, you know, they'll have a tendency to get a slurry buildup on them as the day goes on. So. Uh, this, this burlap drag ought to be changed out uh, at least daily and there's going to be times when you may have to change that strike off off uh, during the, the course of the day. Um, there's different type of uh, strike off that we'll see in a little while but there's a secondary strike off that we're using for the microsurfacing uh, only uh, and that's, that's again to achieve a, a certain desired texture that you're looking for. A couple different Spreader boxes, the one on the left is an older slurry box. Uh, just uh, you can see that uh, you know, mechanically there's, uh, it's not as, not as uh, complex as the, uh, the microsurfacing box. 
We got one set of augers in the, in the uh, slurry box just to keep the material distributed from one side from the center to the outside. Microsurfacing box right away you can see we have a, a dual auger set up in there to keep the material active and moving uh, across, the, across the box. Just a little bit of a, a video to, to show the differences in how those multiple augers will work. You can see the, the bottom of the picture is actually the direction that you're paving in. That first set of augers closer to you is moving the material from the outside of the spreader box back to the middle, where the back auger is actually moving it to the outside of the box to ensure full width coverage. So you can see the material being moved back and forth and keeping, uh, keeping it fluid, not allowing it to set up. Um, we're not using these augers to do any, any further mixing of the material, uh, but just know that it's used to keep the material in agitation and moving and uh, utilized in a uh, uniform manner across the, across the spreader box, uh, enabling uh, uniform application rates. And some of the different types of drags that we talked about a moment ago. Uh, the top left hand picture there is a slurry seal operation going uh, with a burlap drag. Burlap drag will have a tendency to roll that surface aggregate up and give a uniform appearance across the, the full width of the, of the, the surface of the mat. Uh, the right hand picture is a double strike off setup that we have on a microsurfacing box there. Uh, notice the absence of a burlap drag. What happens here is sometimes this, uh, well, this, this secondary rubber strike off is going to embed the rock a little bit more. There are agencies that prefer this type of application, particularly with the microsurfacing. Uh, it will embed the surface rock uh, a, a, a bit more than the, uh, the burlap drag as it's designed to roll the material over and have a more textured surface. And then in the, the bottom middle there is a, a rut box, a rut filling box. You can see it's much narrower. We're, we're designing that box to be uh, applying microsurfacing material to one wheel path rut at a time. So it's not your full width spreader box. On an operation where you have the rut filling to do, you're going to have to fill both ruts one at a time. Some items that you might want to pay attention to with regard to equipment inspection, just be sure everything is working properly uh, with, your, with regard to a spreader box. Again, keeping them clean. We don't want uh, loose material uh, contaminating the mix. Um, Augers on the microsurfacing box in particular. Uh, we don't want them way up in the air. Keep them as close to the roadway as possible. The augers uh, shouldn't be run at such a speed that they're gonna cause that mix to uh, be splashed out of the box or foaming in the corners of the box. Uh, make sure your uh, strike off rubbers, front, side, and back are, are all in good operating shape and placed and, and good and tight. When it comes to rut filling, uh, again, we're only going to use that with microsurfacing, and it's going to be with the coarser aggregate that we talked about earlier, the Type C aggregate. You're going to use a rut filling box to profile ruts that are deeper than a, a half an inch. A minute ago, we talked about some minor leveling that you can do with a full width spreader box with ruts that are not a half an inch or not exceeding a half an inch. So once you start getting into a wheel path rut that's a half inch or deeper, then we need to go to that one. Uh, rut wide box, uh, typically about six feet wide, and we're going to address one rut at a time with it. Be very careful again uh, with, with what type of rut you're trying to fix with this. Uh, we're looking for uh, addressing consolidation ruts on a structurally sound pavement. You know, again, a consolidation rut, you know, you can determine that through coring. Um, if you were paving, uh, if you're correcting ruts on a composite section of pavement, you know, concrete underneath and asphalt overlays, that's probably a good indicator that uh, you're just having some top-down running. That might be a good candidate. Other people have done some pretty uh, uh, extensive ways of determining just what's causing running, and we'll see that in a minute. But you want to be real careful, too, with the plastic deformation. That's stuff that you typically see at uh, intersections or stoplights. Uh, with, with breaking uh, bus, bus pads. Uh, when you see that kind of uh, uh, shoving and running going on, it's typically plastic in nature and isn't going to be able to be fixed with uh, conventional rut filling. And I said, you know, here in North Carolina, they went to pretty extreme methods one time on a section of Interstate 95 to find out just what was causing their rutting. Um, they cut slabs out of the road, actually, half, you know, full lane width slabs 
laid it on its side, and just to be sure that what they were looking at was top-down or consolidation running, um, they determined that the inner layer, the intermediate layer of asphalt was holding its shape, and in fact, all the deformation was happening in that top two inches. Uh, they had done a mill and fill uh, and used a, a surface mix with a lot of wrap material in it, and they never got the uh, densities that they were looking for, and they were afraid that this, uh, this might have been the case. But in that, this instance here, it turned out to be a good candidate for a uh, microsurfacing rut fill job because nothing underneath the surface uh, was failing. You're gonna fill one rut at a time. Um, usually, I don't have a shot of this one right yet, but uh, use a straight edge uh, across the rut just to be sure that you are uh, completely filling that rut. You actually wanna overfill it a little bit to allow for traffic compaction. Uh, but, uh, but use a straight edge to make sure that you're not uh, leaving uh, an indentation there. And there's a finished uh, rut filling job here, um, and it might be worth mentioning uh, that uh, not only do you check application rates while you're rut filling, because the rut depth will vary from station to station, but in this particular case here, it was a rut filling job that was done ahead of a hot mix paving project. Uh, the microsurfacing did a better job uh, being self-leveling and, 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 and filling that consolidation type of rut uh, than they were going to achieve with the hot mix and using a static roller. Uh, so they had uniform compaction, uniform shape uh, by using the microsurfacing ahead of their hot mix guy. As I said, you know, just uh, rule of thumb, uh, you're going to overfill the crown on that rut just a little bit. Uh, for every inch of rut depth, you want to overcrown it about an eighth to a quarter of an inch, and then you're gonna be opening it to traffic before you're putting any sort of a, a surface overlay on it anyway, so, <clears throat> so you're gonna have a, a, a relatively flat rut to be addressed with the second, with the second coat. All right, I think we're getting close, closer to the end of the chapter here. We'll talk a little bit about handwork and, and how we really don't wanna get ourselves in situations where we use a whole lot of it. Uh, the machines are there for a reason. Use the machine to get to where you can get to, but there's going to be places at radiuses or up against buildings or uh, around appurtenances or traffic islands that we might have to do some handwork, but use it minimally. We talked a little bit about the uh, spray bar that wets the pavement ahead of the spreader box uh, when you're on a tangent section of road. So now if we're in a radius of an intersection, um, that's hot and dry, uh, we're gonna need to pre-wet that pavement ahead of any handwork. You wanna be careful with the application rate. You know, you don't wanna have too much down pressure with your squeegees. Uh, try to duplicate the machine placement uh, uh, application rate as much as possible. Uh, work uh, work the, the, the section of handwork in sections if you need to, if there's a lot of it, to avoid the material setting up. And if you're using on a slurry seal job, for instance, a burlap drag behind the machine, utilize a hand burlap drag to duplicate the surface texture that you're using with the machine placed material. And again, uh, we've, we've discussed about masking off appurtenances and swales and gutters uh, with roof and paper. So just keep, keep that as a boundary for your, for your handwork. And uh, in a case where you're doing a slurry seal job there on the left, uh, they're using a burlap drag for finished texture. Use the burlap drag for, uh, uh, for the hand finished texture there as well. And work, work in tandem. The squeegee man and the, and the uh, uh, hand, hand mop guy ought to be working closely, uh, closely together. And there on the bottom is a pretty good size radius that those guys are trying to work and the operator is doing his job with pre-wetting the, the pavement um, to give those guys some working time. I mentioned the down pressure on the squeegee, so the picture on the left here is just in, it's not, not, not consistent uh, application rates being placed by hand. Um, just be mindful of, uh, of what type of, uh, what type of hand work you're doing. Keep the application rate as generous as you can without putting too much material down, but don't steal some material to get to some other part of the radius if you need to, but just be, be very careful to put the right type of application uh, uh, down across the way. Uh, premature wear like that is gonna happen, uh, and it'll be a pretty, pretty telltale evidence sign that, uh, uh, that some improper handwork was done. Um, proper even pressure, simulate the machine placed application rates, masking off of swales and intersections, uh, just leaves for a nice, neat job.
following up what we finished up one of the other chapters with, uh, the, the gradation of stone is consistent. Uh, uh, it's a number 10 rock dust with uh, different sizes of rock from A to C, from finer to coarser. Uh, in your specifications, keep, keep track of that. Uh, for slurry seal applications where you're using type A or type B, uh, minimum application rate is uh, 16 pounds uh, of aggregate per square yard, and your type C application rate will be 20 pounds per square yard. With regard to microsurfacing, it's a little bit different. We're not using any type A material in microsurfacing. So we're going to be using type B and type C only. The minimum application rate for type B would be uh, total application of the mix itself between 18 and 22 pounds per square yard, depending on uh, surface texture more than anything else. Uh, type C or the coarser rock, that application rate can vary from 20 to 24 pounds, again, determining uh, uh, what your surface texture is going to be. And in the specs, check for what application rates are specified for the scratch and level course after rut filling. There's a few things that can affect how thick the application rate will be. Uh, certainly the aggregate gradation, you know, the, uh, uh, the type A, B, or C stone themselves are going to be thicker uh, on typical sections of road. Specific uh, gravity of the aggregate. A type B stone from Northern Virginia may weigh uh, differently than uh, uh, a type B stone in southwest Virginia. Certainly the surface texture of the pavement that you're working on is going to create uh, an, uh, an opportunity for material to be placed heavier or thinner on a smoother piece of pavement. If you've got minor rutting in the pavement section, you know, that, that also can, can definitely add to uh, uh, increased application rates. Your improper setup of a spreader box. You know, if you've got runners that are not, not quite in tune with one another, if you've got uh, a strike-off rubber that's, uh, that's not stretched tight or it's just not, uh, not the same across the width of the, the back of the box, you know, some of these things can affect the final uh, application rates as well. Again, we've seen these pictures here about the differences between the, uh, the surface textures, uh, A, B, and C, from fine to coarse and where we use these mixes in residential areas or interstate highways or arterials or whatnot. Um, so that uh, will bring us to an end in Chapter 4. And if you have any questions, please talk with your uh, classroom facilitator and uh, uh, be a good opportunity right now to review some of your knowledge checks as well.